I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to come to uh, this presentation today. And I'd also like to thank um, Virginia and the rest of the staff at Olin Library for organizing this wonderful series. I actually participated in the one last week <laughs> that was done by my colleague, Stephen Veter. Um, so uh, yes, today I will give you an overview of the great upheaval. Um, and as you see here, this uh, is just a slide representing the table of content. Um, the great upheaval examines a local struggle that became a national effort to shape the nationalist agenda in post-World War II Nigeria. It focuses on a protracted protest against a tax increase launched in 1947 by the Abiyakuta Women's Union and its president, Fumileo Ransom Kuti. The revolt is well known in Nigerian popular history, and many people outside of Nigeria have been introduced to it through um, Wale Shoyinka's memoir, Ake, The Years of Childhood, as well as the Broadway play based on Ransom Kuti's son, Fela. By the time the protest, um, uh, this is the, so there were two people who played uh, Fela during the play, um, and Patti LaBelle played uh, Mrs. Ransom Kuti in, in several, um, in one part of the run of the play. And then the picture on the side is an early picture of her with Fela and his family. Um, by the time the protests ended in July of 1948, they had forced the traditional king and sole native authority, Aleke Adamola, into exile. An Egba interim council that included four appointed women, including Mrs. Ransom Kuti, replaced the old Native Administration Council. The council's first official act included the abolition of taxes on women and an increase of the flat tax rate on men. In 1949, Abeokuta held its first free election. And at the inauguration of the Egba Central Council meeting on July 30th, 1949, the resident declared, today is a momentous occasion in the history of Egba land, for this is the first time that an Egba Central Council consisting of representatives properly elected by the people has met together. Um, and as you see by the end of the quote, he's saying, you know, at this level, um, no one can accuse them of not having a representative council. The tax revolt, however, was the beginning rather than the end of a process for Mrs. Ransom Kuti built on the success of the Abeokuta Women's Union to launch a national women's organization, the Nigerian Women's Union, in 1949. By 1953, the Nigerian Women's Union had branches throughout Nigeria, thus knitting together a wide cross-section of women's organizations to present a uniform set of issues and concerns to the newly formed political parties. Now, there's several things that I argue are significant um, about the tax revolt. First, it was sandwiched between a pair of strikes that many contemporaries and scholars credit with galvanizing the nationalist movement in Nigeria, the first being the general, Lake, general strike in Lagos in 1945, and the second, the Nugu coal miner strike in 1949. Now, most studies of this period provide a general picture of the economic stress men and women across the country faced, but they're most revealing about the conditions of urban working class men. Therefore, an analysis of a revolt conceived and led by women enhances the picture substantially, for it reveals the shared and yet distinctive ways in which the continued economic crisis affected women across the socioeconomic spectrum. Analysis of the tax revolt also refines our understanding of the colonial state and the gender dimensions of colonial tax policy. 
From its inception, Nigeria's tax system was not uniform. When colonial officials created the tax structure, they incorporated local tax systems or fee structures that resembled a tax. Typically, women did not pay an income tax or a poll tax. And in many instances, the colonial state actually used women as a measure of men's wealth for the number of wives a man had determined his tax rate. However, when colonial officials imposed taxes in Abiyakuta in 1918, they taxed women independently of men because officials perceived Egba women as being wealthy traders. Thus, women's anonymous positions as independent taxpayers helped to explain why women in Abiyakuta figured so prominently in anti-colonial nationalist politics. Finally, the tax revolt helps us to better understand the relationship between gender and nationalism in Nigeria. Women use taxation as a platform from which to challenge their political marginalization. Their combined demands for economic amelioration and political participation resonated with the demands of nationalists and wage earners. But these demands also reflected Ransom Kuti's direct and indirect engagement with labor unionists and nationalists. Together, Ransom Kuti and the Abiyakuta Women's Union illuminate the ways in which gender informed nationalist strategies, actions, and thought, as well as the ways in which women helped to construct the nation. It is also informed by Benedict Anderson's study, The Imagined Community, um, which highlighted the important role of culture, especially print culture, in nationalism. But more importantly, I took Partha Chatterjee's ideas to heart. In his text, The Nation and Its Fragments, Chatterjee admonishes scholars for taking, quote, the claims of nationalism to be a political movement too literally, unquote. He argues instead that we must distinguish the ideological and cultural processes of imagining the nation from the political movement that challenged colonial regimes for control of the state. He challenges us to write what he called a cultural history of nationalism in which the process of creating the nation doesn't begin or end with the political movements and the contest for political power against imperial states. I was also influenced by um, Prajanit Duara, a scholar of China who talks about the cultural history of nationalism and insisted that we need to locate, and I'm going to quote this because it's such a great sentence, um, we need to locate the polyphony of voices, contradictory and ambiguous, opposing, affirming, and negotiating their views of the state, rather than succumbing to the harmonized monologic voice of the nation. So the cultural work of creating the nation also unfolds in multiple spaces. Wale Adebanwi's book, Nation as Grand Narratives, the Nigerian Press and the Politics of Meaning, provided an excellent study of the press's role in creating and shaping the narrative of the Nigerian nation. In addition, rituals and ceremonies that are intended for public display and spectacle, as well as things like flags and anthems, are also a part of the symbolic universe that either challenge or reinforce narratives about the nation. The insights that I gained from these scholars is what helped me to appreciate the story of the tax revolt as part of a much longer history of the narrative construction of the nation in Abeokuta. And I was able to tease that out by examining Abeokuta's centenary celebration in 1930 that is discussed in Chapter 2, and the Abeokuta Women's Union's Thanksgiving celebration following the tax revolt, and that is discussed in Chapter 6. And I argue that juxtaposing these events provide a more nuanced understanding of how the idea of the nation and women's place in it evolved in the first half of the 20th century. So just to give you some bearings here. So Abe Kuta 
oh, I don't know. If, oh, there, <laughs> you probably see it. Um, so it's north of Lagos here. You see where Lagos is at the bottom um, of this map here, and then Abiyakuta is a little further to the north. Um, it was founded in 1830, and it was comprised primarily of subgroups of the Yorubas, specifically the Egba and Owu refugees, from um, whose towns were destroyed during the political instability that resulted from the collapse of the Oyo Empire. The refugees recreated their hometowns, and as a result, Abeyakuta is actually made up of 150 townships that spread out beyond Olumo Rock. And this is an image of the rock here, um, and it's really a very high point and you, for security purposes. It was really important during the 19th century. Um, I can tell you a story later on about the rock, too. <laughs> So uh, the town was organized into four provinces. Each province recognized a king. Government um, included an, the Ogboni, sort of the civil arm of government, that acted as a, as a check on the power of the kings and the Ologun, the military chiefs. Abikuta's political history is distinctive within the larger history of British colonialism in Nigeria since educated Egbas helped the chiefs to craft a treaty in which the Lagos government recognized Abiyakuta as a self-governing kingdom enveloped by the protectorate. Under the Egba, 19, um, under the Egba United government, led by a Lake Badebo and a bureaucracy of mission-educated men, the town maintained its independence until 1914. For residents of Abiyakuta and Lagos, the Egba United government had been a highly valued expression of national identity and sovereignty. For many people, a robust Abiyakuta um, held significance beyond the borders of Abiyakuta and even Lagos colony. During his um, coronation in 1898, Badeba urged um, the maintenance and support of the king, independence of the kingdom, arguing that if it was properly with, upheld, it would, have, it would confound the opinion of the detractors of the Negro race. And I've just put here some of the quotes that came from newspapers from the period, and you get a sense of how proud people were of this kingdom whose sovereignty was protected during this period. But a combination of, fact, a combination of factors led many to believe that Abiyakuta had in fact surpassed Lagos as a center or site of progress um, in several measurable ways. Um, in addition to having the railroad, roads, a uh, telegraph network, a water system, the people of Abiyakuta pooled their resources together in 1908 and founded the Abiyakuta Grammar School, which was Nigeria's first secondary school not attached to a Christian missionary. Um, and in this picture here, um, you also see Reverend Ransom Kuti, who was the principal, uh, the headmaster of the grammar school um, in the 1930s, as well as Mrs. Ransom Kuti and some of the students. Therefore, people were crushed when the Lagos government used the political crisis in the town in 1914 to argue that the Alake was not in control and Lagos abrogated the treaty. Abiyakuta was then incorporated into the amalgamated Nigeria. Now, people experienced even greater pain when a tax revolt erupted in 1918. In response to rebels who destroyed the symbols of the colonial state, the courthouses, the railway, the telegraph lines, troops destroyed houses and farms and massacred hundreds of people. Bodies were piled up in heaps for public view. And this colonial violence was for public spectacle and consumption in order to reinforce Britain's hegemony over the town. So given the history of sovereignty, the centenary celebration in 1930 assumed political importance for multiple parties. 
Um, I just thought you'd appreciate Adamola visited Oxford in 1937, <laughs> and someone sent me these um, photographs of his visit uh, last year, actually. Too late to have gone in the book, but. <laughs> um, for Alake Adamola, who succeeded Badebo, it provided an opportunity to showcase Abiyakuta's modernity, its roads, electricity, its piped waters. He would argue that Abiyakuta was far ahead of the rest of Nigeria and should therefore regain its sovereignty. He commissioned several histories to be written. Two were written by British-trained Egba lawyers, Ladipo Shalanke and Adebisin Folarin, um, who supported the claims for Abiyakuta's independence, as well as the argument that the Alake, though technically the king of Ake pro province, was historically the center of political power. The colonial government also had an investment in supporting the centenary celebrations in spite of the, in, um, the economic depression because it gave them an opportunity to showcase the efficacy of British colonial rule. Colonial officials perceived Abiyakuta as, quote, an example of the highest development of the principles of indirect rule to be found in the southern provinces. They also used the town as a training ground for um, uh, heirs in the pipeline for other communities. So the heir of the throne to um, Benin, and, and this is Benin, the old republic, um, kingdom of Benin, not the current republic of Benin, but the heir to the throne of the, of, um, the kingdom of Benin was actually sent to Abiyakuta to train under um, Alake Adamola, and he was not the only one um, sent to train under Adamola. The celebration stretched over nine days from October 26, 1930 to November 2, 1930 with performances, lectures, dances, and religious celebrations. Three years of planning and thousands of pounds were invested in the event and in the construction of Centenary Hall. I mean, literally, the name of the building is a signifier of the centenary celebrations, and uh, it still exists. It's still standing. Um, it is estimated that 400,000 people visited Abiyakuta over the course of the celebrations. Um, the colonial government even granted vacation to Egba workers on the Nigerian whale, railway so that they could return home for the events. People brought, bought special cloths that were made for the celebration. Um, Reverend J.J. Ransom Kuti, Fela's grandfather, actually wrote the words for what became the Egba National Anthem. Um, and the celebration also was an opportunity to mark the town's national heroes. The resident at the time unveiled a sculpture that was created in the memory of the national heroes and here the heroes were specifically those 19th century military leaders who brought the Egba to Abiyakuta and then secured its sovereignty. On October 28th, when they officially opened Centenary Hall, they unveiled photographs of prominent Abiyakuta citizens. All of them were professional men. Most of them were lawyers and doctors. October 29th was set aside as Ogboni Day, and the state drums were brought out. Um, and that day's celebration concluded with an oral play. Now, I have to explain that in the pre-colonial period, when the Ogboni chiefs wielded considerable power, they also had the power over life and death. And Oro was the figure that um, was their enforcer and would carry out any executions. Women were not supposed to see Oro, and so whenever Oro came out, women were supposed to stay in hiding in their houses. They were supposed to leave the markets. Now, reporters for West Africa magazine packaged Abiyakuta's celebration for readers back in England as well. Um, so they uh, sent, they covered the Alake's message to the king of England, they also described his dress in detail. And, um, oh, sorry about that. 
So as they say here, yes, the Alake wore a crown of solid gold, massive in design, beautiful in workmanship, a gold chain from which hung two elephants carved in African gold, heavy gold bracelets encircling his wrists, robes of exquisite silk embroidered with gold th threads, and a Rolls Royce landed in time for the centenary conveying him to the various um, ceremonies. So whereas most people were walking to the different places where events were um, happening, he was driving in his Rolls Royals. So this description invoked a visual image of the Alake that was virtually wrapped in gold. His adornment and the Rolls Royce signaled splendor of a magnitude that was exponential given that this is in the middle of the Depression. So the spectacle of nationness was deeply gendered. Um, its main performers were the Alake, colonial officials, and the chiefs who held senior Ogboni and military titles. The photographs unveiled in Centenary Hall featured another group of men who competed for power and authority in Abeokuta. That other group were Christian, highly educated professionals, self-made men, whose fortunes and status existed outside of the spaces controlled by the colonial bureaucracy or British capital. Collectively, they reflected the new social hierarchy that marginalized men who were not Christian and literate. These men were also family men with wives who were Christian, literate, and socially engaged. Like the Alake, they valued education for their daughters, um, and girls in general. However, they did not envision a political role for women, whether educated or not. On multiple levels, the centenary celebrations affirmed the singularity of nation and masculinity. The first planning meeting, in fact, of the centenary celebra um, celebration committee occurred on March 14, 1927, but the first time women were invited to the meeting was June 9, 1930. Um, and they were actually only informed of the arrangements and were told to form a committee to select women who would receive titles. Yet, Egba women were completely absent from the program. They were not present among those honored um, in any of the, the, the cenotaph that was created or among the photographs in Centenary Hall. The program didn't even mention the installation of women's titles. Women appeared only in the scenery of the celebrations. They populated the crowds that traveled from Lagos. They witnessed the unveiling of the cenotaph. They processed to Alumo Rock, danced at nighttime competitions, and enjoyed the garden parties and balls. They remained anonymous, undifferentiated, and virtually invisible in the cultural representation of the nation. Now, not all men celebrated this male-centric vision of the Egba nation. In fact, A.K. Ajisafe, in his book, Abiyakuta Centenary and its Celebrations, offered searing critiques of the events. He was very critical of the glorification of the Alake and the role of Christians, and he also highlighted the absence of women during these celebrations. Now, the tax revolt reflected the coming together of two groups of women. And so I'm skipping over a lot here, and we can, you can ask more questions about that after. Um, but specifically, it was a coalition of elite Christian women who belonged to the Abiyakuta Women's, Abiyakuta Ladies Club that was led by Mrs. Ransom Kuti and market women's associations. Two key factors contributed to their coalition. The elite women's interest in social uplift and, economic, and the economic circumstances market women faced after World War II and the years immediate, immediately afterwards, which forced them to seek advocates among the Christian elite women. During World War II, rice was designated an essential commodity for the civilian and military populations in West Africa, and Nigeria was tasked to produce rice for itself and for export to Gambia and Sierra Leone. Given its proximity to Lagos, farmers in Abeokuta were ordered to produce 3,000 tons of rice annually. 
This figure may not sound that outrageous, but given the fact that usually they produced about 500 tons of rice, <laughs> To now be ordered to produce 3,000 tons of rice which was a major um, task imposed on them. Um, the Alake's agents told the villagers how much to produce. Colonial officials set the price that farmers would be paid, as well as the price at which market women could sell rice in the markets. Both farmers and traders complained that the prices were too low However, the government did not take their concerns into consideration. Instead, they put in place several mechanisms to ensure that the authorities in Lagos receive the required amount of rice at the control time. So, for example, they put in place a license system and farmers could only legally sell rice to those wholesale buyers that had a license. Um, after the war, some of these mechanisms actually continued. So an order was put into effect on October 20th, 1949, that compelled um, truck drivers to carry specific amounts of rice depending on the road that they traveled to reach Abiyakuta. And if they didn't have the required amount of rice, then the trucks were not allowed to actually get to Abiyakuta. Um, police were given official sanction to seize rice from farmers and traders. In many cases, these farmers and traders were not reimbursed. Um, so it was in this context that rice sellers reached out to Mrs. Ransom Kuti, then the president of the Abia Kuta Ladies Club, and she wrote letters on their behalf to the Alake and district officers. The crisis around rice sellers was still unresolved when discussions about a tax increase began. Moreover, Native Authority police were empowered to aggressively pursue tax collection. Men and women who could not produce a receipt to prove that they had paid their taxes were jailed. Native Authority police also had um, permission to expose young women's breasts, for they believed that they could determine if girls were old enough to pay taxes by the size of their breasts. I should also note that girls were taxed an age a year younger than young men. And so together, this struggle over rice, the tax increase, and the aggressive and egregious practices of the Native Authority Police crystallized this convergence of market women and elite women into the Abiyakuta Women's Union and focus their attention on the Alake's abuse of power. Now, as these, this organization came into existence, they also created um, a constitution. They had their aims and objectives. And the constitution succinctly expressed the nature of the coalition as well as its aims and objectives. And as you see, the very first thing, it's to establish and maintain unity and cooperation among all women in Egbo land. Um, to encourage mass, um, mass education among the women through teaching its members to read and write. And I should mention here that if you read um, Ake, um, Shoyinka's book, Ake, one of the things he talks about is that he was among the people teaching these market women to read and write. Um, and in fact, um, Mrs. Ransom Kuti's eldest son was also one of the tutors of these market women. Their motto also efficiently highlighted their political goals, unity, cooperation, selfless service, and democracy. The Women's Union utilized a variety of strategy to register the women's displeasure and to call attention to their critique of colonial rule. In addition to letters and petitions to the Alake and the resident, they organized mass rallies outside the courts and jails where women were arrested for non-payment of taxes. They wore special cloths that identified them as supporters of the tax campaigns. They organized vigils in front of the palace, which effectively held the Alake under siege in the palace for several days at a time. And during these vigils, 
um, and two critical ones happened in 47. The first one, November 29th and 30th, and then the second one, December 8th through 10th, markets were closed. And women organized food and water so that they could sleep outside the palace. Now, we have to appreciate, most people did not have electricity and refrigerators, so people needed to buy food very, very frequently. And if the markets are closed, folks are starving. So they also sang abusive songs to the Alake. Some of these songs questioned his um, virility, others accused him of um, theft, while others overturned Yoruba gender order. And I'm actually just going to talk a little bit about the second song here that talks about um, Oro having no regard for men. The cultural and political significance of Oro, as I'd mentioned earlier, made this song especially potent, for with it, the women subverted this icon associated primarily with male power and seniority. Instead of women hiding from Oro, it was going to be men hiding from Oro in their rooms. And so in performing their own Oro festival, male power was being made silent and invisible. In addition to the marches, vigils, and um, in some instances, undressing in public to um, show their rejection of, um, of Adamola's rule, they mined history. The Women's Union borrowed the slogan of the American Revolution, no taxation without representation. They argued that it was unfair for women to pay taxes if they did not have political representation. And even though they insisted that Abe Akuta's long history of taxing women independently from men was an anomaly, they nonetheless used that taxpayer status to lay claim to the evolving discussion on democracy. And they justified this demand for political participation by highlighting one of the most formidable women of the 19th century, Madame Tinubu. Now, I found this image of her online. I'm not convinced it's an, a genuine image, but. <laughs> so Tinubu was um, an important trader. She was actually evicted from Lagos in 1856 because of her clashes with the British government and European traders. And then she settled in Abiyakuta. Um, she had a substantial trade in slaves in cotton, palm oil, as well as ammunition. In 1864, she was named the first Yellow Day of the Egba, a reward for her support during the Dahomean invasion of that year. And I'll just say as an aside here, after watching Warrior King, if anybody wants to talk about that, we can say, talk about, I will be happy to do that because Abiyakuta was one of the towns where the Dahomean armies um, had invaded several times. Um, and so, Tanubu didn't confide herself, though, to just trade. She was a kingmaker. She undermined the alakes she disliked and offered her own candidates for the throne. And so this title that was given to her as this reward for her support in 1864 not only recognized her, but it also recognized women as a political constituency within the political hierarchy of the town. Um, and Tanubu invested it with political power. During the tax revolt, the women's union used Tanubu as an effective and strategic icon. They prayed at her graveside before protests in order to ask for strength and protection. The women's actions made the town essentially ungovernable, and the Alake's power weakened considerably by 1948 when he lost the support of the Council of Chiefs, and Reverend Ransom Kuti played a really instrumental role in creating this wedge between the Council of Chiefs and the Alake. And in that year's annual report, it stated that due to the women's demonstrations, the Alake advocated and moved to another town. Following his departure, they then started plans for this um, celebration. The Thanksgiving celebration happened, um, was, ran from July 29th to August 2nd. And here, 
um, there were a number of events that were organized. So there were dances throughout the town, a Thanksgiving service at St. John's Church um, in Igbane, a picnic at the site of Madame Tanubu's grave, as well as a lecture by the director, deputy director of education for the Western province. Um, I just want to show you just an excerpt of some of the events that were happening during this period. Uh, and I want to point out that, uh, so they included actually the Ogboni, but if you notice that there were ceremonies at um, churches as well as mosques. And so it reflected really the cross-section of Abeokuta society. It reflected, yes, the religious and cultural diversity in Abiyakuta, as well as the broad cross-section of groups that supported the women's union. And following the extensive celebration and speeches, the women's union published a pamphlet that documented some of the speeches as well as um, photographs of the events. The cover actually had a picture of Adamola um, next to the title, The Fall, a Fall of a Ruler or the Freedom of Egba Land. And the pamphlet was, is an important political document because it offers their narrative of the crisis. Through the selection of text, speeches, quotes, and photographs, readers were presented with the historical antecedents that supported the Abiyakuta Women's Union Re Revolutionary Movement. Individuals who stepped forward, they highlighted individuals who stepped forward to save their community from threats, as well as the immediate factors that generated the threat. So they highlighted the Alake's abuse of power, as well as the political marginalization and impoverishment of women. All of these things were really brought together in the speech given by the Reverend Superintendent O.K. during the Thanksgiving service in Centenary Hall on August 22nd. Um, and here, part of what I, I want to highlight, um, you know, so he's using Egypt as a reference for the, the crisis that Abiy Akutub faced. And, you know, we have, we have cause to thank God as the Egba United Women's Union and others are now doing this morning through the leadership of Ransom Kuti. Um, and he makes this argument that even though people are referring to her as the number one woman leader, that actually she's the number two woman leader. And he highlights Tinubu and her role as this historical figure of national significance and importance. Um, one of the things to, I think that's significant about the way in which he highlighted Tinubu here is because she actually, after she got that title in 1864, was catapulted to the level of a national hero that included those military leaders that had liberated the Egba from Oyo imperialism and those leaders that had safely brought them to Olumo Rock and then protected their sovereignty up until 1914. So the recognition of Tinubu's critical role in the national politics of 1860s stand in stark contrast then to her erasure during the centenary celebration in 1930. In invoking Tinubu as the predecessor ancestor of Ransom Kuti, Reverend Kuti, Reverend O.K. rather, legitimated Ransom Kuti's leadership as well as the actions of the Women's Union, arguing that they did in less than 24 months what wavering men had failed to do in 28 years. So it's important to appreciate too that in 1948, there was no threat of invasion comparable to the invasion of the Dahomeans in 1864. However, there was a palpable fear of bloodshed in the town. And even the British resident, John, Clare, John Blair, rather, made clear that the threat of force was seriously considered on multiple times. In fact, he had the army waiting at the edge of the town 
just in case things got so out of control he would have brought the troops in. Blair's fear of a comparable, in fact, he compared the crisis to the crisis in 1918 during that tax revolt. Um, but what you get from both Blair's writings as well as um, Reverend O'Kay's um, speech was that there was tremendous fear, tension, and brinkmanship that marked this historical moment. In this battle, though, against an internal form of tyranny, Ransom Kuti was the liberator in the footsteps of Lisabi, who had um, rescued them from Oyo, and then Tinubu, who had protected them from Dahomey. The AWU incorporated other political actors and thinkers as well to legitimate their activism. Um, and in fact, I think you'll appreciate this. So they had quotes in that pamphlet from all of these um, European thinkers. <laughs> Um, now, the available records do not reveal the process through which these quotes were selected. However, they were not random because the, pro the pamphlet was edited by Abiodun Oloba, a journalist who worked for several newspapers in Nigeria. The quotes express the political ideals that guided the actions of the Abiyakuta Women's Union as well as their underlying conceptualization of state society relations. Through these quotes, the women union, Women's Union argued that the purpose of government was to secure the well-being of the governed. And since that expectation was not being met, they had an obligation to challenge the Alake's monopoly of the use and exercise of power, as well as, um, as, well as his abuse of power. The quotes justified the women's mass rallies and vigils and demonstrated their commitment to the ideals articulated by some of the most venerated theorists, theorists of secular liberal democracies, although theorists who themselves did not imagine women playing a role in politics. So what I want to say in conclusion then is that the tax revolt forced a radical transformation of politics in Abiy Akuta and further cemented a larger process that expanded the boundaries of nation from Abiy Akuta to Nigeria. It also established that women had a central role to play in leading the new nation. Whereas the centenary had celebrated male monopoly of political space and the Alake as the center of political power, the tax revolt opened up politics. For the first time, the Egbas could vote for members of the council. Um, equally important, women could vote and run for seats. Um, the centenary celebration also championed a return to Abiyakuta's sovereign status that was revoked in 1914. However, by the end of World War II, the idea of an independent Abiyakuta had waned in light of a growing sensibility of Nigerian-ness. Um, and both Ransom Kuti, the Reverend as well as Mrs. Ransom Kuti actually, played key roles in spreading the idea of Nigeria the nation, for they were founding members of the first major nationalist organization, and Ransom Kuti herself was part of a seven-member delegation that toured Nigeria and then traveled to London, um, demanding constitutional changes that recognized Nigerians as participating members in a new form of political organization. So I will stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and are there questions? And I will pass this microphone to anybody that has a question. Do you have a question with the story about the rock? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, um, uh, yeah, Luma Rock. <laughs> when I was a grad student, I, um, you know, I was at University of Ibadan and decided I wanted to visit Luma Rock. And so, um, one of the young men who worked in the um, history department said he would drive me down there. 
And so we got there and I came in a dress. I, I didn't plan to do anything really other than see the rocks. But there are these guides that are there. And so they insisted that we should walk up the rocks. And um, see if I can go back and, oh, no, OK. Um, so there are a set of steps that go up to a certain point, And then after that, you, you do rock climbing. You know, you put your hands in those cracks. And so um, there I am in this dress climbing to the top of a little rock. And there's this particular crevice between the rocks. And I saw the guide come up behind the young man from the history department and pick him up and jump across. And I was like, oh, no, 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 you're not doing that to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I walked along until I found a spot that narrowed. And then I jumped across myself. And so on the way back down, though, I didn't know when we were getting to that spot. And the guy just came up behind me, scooped me up, and jumped across. I, I was so terrified. I was like, that's it. I will never climb a Lumo rock again. <laughs> but that's, though, why I got that picture that you saw <laughs> from the top of the rock. <laughs> from online. if we can figure out how this works. Thanks. Um, I have a question here um, that says, could you please talk about your research process? Which archival re repositories did you consult? Um, were they mostly in Nigeria or elsewhere? Thank you. OK, it's a great question. Um, so I consulted several archives. So in Nigeria, the National Archives, um, uh, that's on the campus of the University of Ibadan. Um, the, and they had a lot of colonial records there. Um, at the Kenneth DK Library, um, special collections there, and this is the main camp, uh, library on the campus of Ibadan also. Um, they had the Ransom Kuti papers, so I spent quite a bit of time there too. They also had the papers of Herbert Macaulay, who is considered the father of nationalism in Nigeria. Um, Ladipo Shalanke's papers are at the university, or UNILAG, University of Lagos. Um, so I spent time there, too. I also spent time at University of Ife going through the criminal court records. So one of the things that I have in the chapters on the war um, were um, discussions about some of the cri criminal cases brought against people charged with moving rice illegally, as well as other foodstuffs. Um, I used the archives in Abayakuta. When I first started doing research, and <laughs> this project did take me quite a while, so um, in the 80s, the Egbo records were actually in Centenary Hall. So that was where I used to hang out um, then. And then they subsequently built a branch of the National Archives in Abeykut, and a lot of those records were moved there. Um, and then I spent a lot of time in England at the, um, the National Archives in Kew. Um, also, a lot of time in Oxford at the Old Rhodes House Library because um, I'm drawing a blank on his, oh, Anthony Kirk Green uh, had um, started this project where he asked former colonial officials to donate papers to write reminiscences, reminiscences um, of their time in the colonial service. And so it is a very eclectic collection, but it was really wonderful. And one of the things, um, so actually, my first book was about the tie-dyeing industry in Abeyakuta. And I, in doing the work at Rhodes House, I came across um, a box of, of papers and stories written by a colonial official who had served in Abeyakuta in 1939. And this was in the 90s. And the rule is that you need permission from the person who donated the papers or their estate in order to cite that work. And so I literally wrote off to them and I said, I hope this letter finds you well. 
Um, and actually, it did. And it turns out to be this really, really, you know, generous man. Um, they lived, he and his wife lived in Winchester. And so I used to go visit them. And so I interviewed him. Um, he talked about, you know, knowing the Alake and how terrified he was as a young district officer because the Alake was such an imposing personality. And the Alake actually didn't like dealing with the district officers. He only wanted to deal with the resident. Um, he, you know, so he knew some of the main people that I was talking about. Um, but the other thing about meeting him that was really important, there was an association of former um, officials of the Western region, and they used to have annual meetings. And so through him, I actually went to a few of their meetings <laughs> and then interviewed other people who had served in the Western region, too. So um, yeah, I used archives anywhere. Any lead I could get, I would pursue stuff. You know, I did a lot of stuff with newspapers. Um, and I have to admit, it's one of the comments that um, kept showing up as people reviewed the book just about the meticulous research. And I thought, well, yeah, I did take 30 years. So. <laughs> um, this actually was my original dissertation topic. Yeah. But I had the good sense to know back then that I didn't have enough under my belt to write about this tax revolt. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Judy. Um, I, very early in, in the presentation, you were talking about the importance of looking at culture um, in thinking about nationalism. And so I wanted to get a sense from you of, and I don't mean to make it very stark, right? In the sense that, uh, is the tax revolt a political act? Or is it, what is the cultural component as well? Right. Or, or if you could take me through that. Right, so there yeah. are several parts to it actually. So one, the tax revolt itself, um, you know, relied on different cultural practices for people to register their displeasure with the Alake. So holding him under siege in the palace was one. And that wasn't the first time. He wasn't the only Alake who was subjected to that. Um, also, the, the singing of the abusive songs to him, very standard treatment when people are upset with their leaders. Um, their undressing, um, and particularly when older women undress, it's a taboo. And it's, it's a way of really signaling the height and, or depth of their displeasure. Um, but I would say, so there were all these cultural features that were a part of the protests in different ways. Um, but then the big thing that I do focus on, though, is the Thanksgiving celebration. And that really was an entire cultural or set of cultural events that defined the Alake's rule as a tyrannical rule as opposed to how he presented it in 1930 as you know him being at the height of the progress that Abiy Kuta had experienced um, and again that you know they had a responsibility to address the tyranny um, so that's partly why I think reading the Thanksgiving celebration against the centenary celebration was really an important thing to do. I think we've got, oh, questions are coming now. Thanks so much, Judy, and congratulations on this wonderful book. I want to ask about um, uh, the kind of anti-colonial uh, uh, you know, impulses here and the extent to which the Alake is, you know, framed as a product of colonial, colonialism, of British rule, and the extent to which, you know, you, that was fascinating, those quotes from uh, Jefferson, uh, Fox, uh, mm -hmm. Acton, to what extent are the uh, women's union referencing other uh, anti-colonial struggles, uh, other women's movements in other parts of the world. So he's interested in the kind of, you know, uh, 
ideological framing in right. terms of in terms of anti-colonial politics. Thank you. Oh, so um, one of the things that's just fascinating, um, I didn't bring up in this talk today, but um, in Abe Kutu, they were very engaged in the hands-off Ethiopia movement. And um, there was this Jamaican woman <laughs> who shows up in the archives. Her husband was very involved in the nationalist politics and actually was a co-founder of the first political party in Lagos. Um, and he was also the founder of the Garvey chapter in Lagos. And so when Italy invaded Ethiopia, she was organizing visits around Nigeria to get women involved in supporting Ethiopia and fundraising. And so in actually the Egba archives in Abiyakuta, I found letters that she wrote to the Alake saying, I'm coming to town. Um, I want you and you know the other important personalities to get the women together. And so um, hundreds of women showed up at these events. And I have a, a list of all the women. I think the list is like 184 people and the amount of money that they contributed. Um, so they're all already aware of uh, certainly um, fascism in the 1930s. Um, but Abikuta also had a branch of the um, national, is it, I'm drawing a blank on the exact name now, but there was a, a West African organization, um, the British West African, um, I'm looking at my Nigerian students here. <laughs> uh, Congress of British West Africa, something like that, in the 1920s. Um, there was a branch of that in Abiyakuta from the 1920s. Um, Deuce Muhammad, who um, was an important figure, the first Egyptian to write a history of Egypt and um, started the African and Oriental Review in London um, with um, Casely Hayford. Uh, he visits Abiyakuta in the 1920s and chats with the Alake. Um, and so there are all of these people coming through. And then Ladipo Shalanke is really important because he would remain in London. He went you know, to study law there. And then he was the founder of WASU, the West African Student Union, that was really the first organization to call for independence. Um, and he had set up um, sort of a housing, a hostel for West African students in London. And he's from Abiyakuta. When the Alake's daughter was studying in London, he was her guardian. And so there was a tremendous amount of correspondence between Shalanke and the Alake. The Alake was one of the patrons of Wasu. But then he was also a classmate of Reverend Ransom Kuti. And so he was very close to both Ransom Kutis. And so again, a lot of communication um, between um, Shalanke and the Ransom Kutis. And so part of what I argue in the book, too, is that so many people, when they're you know, talking about the sort of the political currents and the connection between Pan-Africanism and Nigeria sort of focus on Lagos, but Abiyakuta had its own separate and distinct relationship with those Pan-African currents, too. Hi. Uh, so I'm Nigerian, and I grew up in Nigeria, but I attended like an American international school in Abuja. Mm -hmm. And so um, we had like a Nigerian studies course, but it was very much like a very like quick course, just mostly going over like independence and mm -hmm. the Biafran War. So in terms of like, I never learned like the history and things like this. And in current, I feel like Nigerian political um, culture, it's still very like male dominated. So I guess my question would be in terms of like, in terms of like the current sphere right now, how do we stay like educated in these like topics of like knowing the history and knowing that women have the ability to like create change in the political spheres? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, and it's, it's sort of funny too, because last week I gave a talk for the Transitional Justice um, Center in Abuja, um, and you know, on Zoom of course. Um, <laughs> 
But this was part of the conversation. And part of what I was arguing was that knowing this history is so important to the work that they are trying to do because um, you know, people don't necessarily realize that women were so engaged politically in the nationalist period, right up through the 1950s. Um, and they don't have a sense of the sort of political, um, of their contribution to the political discussion. And so whereas now, one of the things that came up in this discussion last week was about the idea of affirmative action for women so that they should reserve you know, up to say 25 or 30 percent of um, seats for women candidates. That was discussed in the 1950s. Ransom Kuti was already talking about that. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I think it's, you know, part of what I suggested to them was that there needs to be a tremendous amount of political education um, where not just um, political education that talks about politics in a different way, um, where people talk about what candidates are running for, what are their platforms, what are their policies. And the thing is that Ransom Kuti was already commenting on some of this stuff in the 50s um, because she, she, she had these speeches, and I talk about speeches a bit more in the book, but where she said, you know, you don't get citizenship just from being born in Lagos. You got to do something for your community. <laughs> That's what makes you a citizen. Um, so for her, it, it had to be an active engagement. Um, and which is why I, I, in the motto where they talk about selfless service, this issue of service was central to how they thought about politics. Um, the other thing, too, is that she said, you know, <laughs> Just because somebody buys you a bottle of beer does not mean they should be buying your vote. Um, and so these are issues, again, that are, you know, right, are on the agenda today. And so I think that that sort of organization, actually, I think I was suggesting to them, can do an important role in transforming the vocabulary um, of the political landscape, um, as well as encouraging more women, um, but there also has to be infrastructure put in place that um, makes it easy for a wider cross-section of people to actually run for office. Thank you for that great last question.